Well, dear friends, uh, <clears throat> I thought that at this uh, start of the season of uh, holidays and holy days for Jews and Christians and Baha'is, it would be November and December or in the days that uh, the birth of Baha'u'llah takes place, the ascension of Abdul Baha and the day of the covenant of the Baha'i faith. Those are very holy times and significant times. And then Hanukkah period is follows that and then Christmas follows that. So it is a time that people hopefully begin to think about spirituality. And uh, I thought that it would be a good idea to reflect on topic of spirituality. What is spirituality in practice, in application to life? And, uh, and this is important because the central aim of the Baha'i faith is to create a spiritual civilization and a spiritual lifestyle. So, it's, we have to understand, therefore, what is spirituality and how a spiritual lifestyle expresses itself in everyday life. And... Uh, because this is a complex issue, I first begin, I'm going to begin by reading a paragraph. It's a rather long paragraph uh, that I wrote about the spirituality in uh, uh, one of my books called Unity of Faith and Reason in Action. And uh, here is what I said about the spirituality. The spirituality is the most misunderstood aspect of human nature. Some equate spirituality with religiosity and others with emotionality. Some consider spirituality to be equivalent of being superstitious and illogical, and still others consider spirituality to be the property of arts and nature alone. Others consider anything that is beyond their comprehension to be spiritual. Some equate spirituality with being moral and ethical, and there are also other people and other perspectives on this issue. A spirituality has some of the qualities found in these various definitions. However, a spirituality is a far more complex and comprehensive reality. In fact, a spirituality is the core reality of being human. It reflects, it refers to the human power of consciousness and our constant search for meaning and purpose. Spirituality connects the past, the present, and the future. It integrates our sense of mortality and immortality and helps us to face death from the perspective of existence rather than nothingness. A spirituality concerns, uh, connects us with the source of all creation and in the process enable us to become creators ourselves. A spirituality makes it possible for us 
to be both unique and united, thus freeing us from the dichotomous mindsets, which is the cause of much destruction and sorrow. This elusive, mysterious, yet essential reality is increasingly absent from the discourse of our time. And it goes on. So as you see, I had difficulty to define spirituality here, and I will have difficulty tonight also. <laughs> so <laughs> not much progress has been made. <laughs> okay, so that's the way life is. And uh, I, I thought that is a good idea to realize that although people try very hard to develop condition of spirituality without connection with God, that in reality, this is not possible. Because everything that we see in this life is constantly changing. The nature is constantly changing. The seasons changing. We as human beings in our thoughts and feelings and emotions are changing. Other people constantly change and we cannot predict how they are going to behave. Everything changes. But the spirituality is a constant state of being. It is a condition that evolves but doesn't disappear. You know, uh, when summer is here, it is warm. And when winter comes, the summer is gone. It, it has replaced it. But in spirituality, that's not the condition. The condition is that it is constant. It's, it has a profound impact. It is ever present in our lives. And it causes us to transform. It causes us to transform. And that's why the greatest reservoir of spirituality in human history always have been religions. And religions impact on the spiritual nature of human beings through the creative word of the revelation. You see, uh, the word of God has different impact that the, than the word of human beings. I'll give you some examples so you see how it works. When uh, I was living in Iran many years ago, in early 1950s, which would be about 60 years ago, there was a uh, profound crisis in the Baha'i community of Iran similar to what is happening, but not as awful as it's happening right now. At that time, there was a, an ayatollah, a religious leader of Muslims, who was given the free reign on the radio. We didn't have television at that time, thank God, <laughs> uh, because I understand he was very ugly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he had a good, a good uh, way of talking. So anyway, he was given a free reign on the radio during the month of Ramadan. To Ramadan is the month of fasting in Islam to attack the Baha'is, and he did. He began to attack the Baha'is day after day after day. 
and the masses raised up. All Baha'i uh, centers were taken over. All Baha'i cemeteries were practically destroyed. Many Baha'is were uh, persecuted in different places. A number of them were killed. So it was a major, major crisis that lasted several years. And uh, and when it gradually decreased those problems, I remember that I was at that time a youth and uh, at the early years of my medical school, and uh, we decided that we were going to uh, go and visit a Baha'i community in a small uh, mountainous village called Kata. Kata was located some uh, 300 kilometers from Isfahan, one of the main cities in Iran. And it was in the heart of a tribal community of Bakhtiaris. And for the five years, we hadn't heard anything from the Baha'i community of Kata. There had been no communication. So it was, we decided that young people to have a trip visit the Kata. Okay, that was our plan. And uh, we uh, organized a group, and the group was uh, uh, consisted of a physician and uh, few other individuals with different capacities and a teacher and so forth. These are all very young people at university. And uh, we uh, decided to find out how to get to Qatar, uh, rented the car, and went to uh, a garage, a place that uh, uh, was a place of trucks uh, coming for, uh, that were going to that region of the country for uh, uh, bringing lumber, lumber wood. So we wanted to find out how to get there and so forth. And I remember we went there Two of us went there, and a number of uh, very uh, manly men were sitting around and smoking with big mustaches and uh, looking really rough people. And uh, and here we were shaven young adolescents and uh, late adolescents, and and said. We have come here to find out about uh, how to, what's the best way to go to Qatar. And there was a big man with really outstanding mustache, and uh, he said, why you're going there? I said, well, we are going to visit some friends. He said, who are your friends? And he was so authoritative that you couldn't uh, not answer him. You had to answer him, okay? And said, well, uh, uh, our friend is Mir Eshkola. Mir Eshkola, by the, ne- by the way, means, Mir means uh, ser or, you know, something like that. Eshkola means love of God. So this guy's name was 
love of God. <laughs> or ser love of God. <laughs> or mister love of God. Mirish <laughs> Okay. Mirish He said, well, he's a Babi, meaning he's a Baha'i. I said, yeah. He said, you come there and I kill you. Said, That's nice. <laughs> so we said, where, uh, who are you? And he gave his name. And sure enough, the day before, his, there was a huge headlines in the newspapers that this leader of that segment of Bakhtiari had been released from prison after five years because of murdering somebody five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and his picture was in the newspaper also. Sure enough, he was, he was true. He was That's capable of it. I said, well, we have a doctor and we have some medication with us and we are just going to go there and visit people and help people to, if they are sick and so forth, because there are no doctors there and so forth. That's all we are doing. And we are leaving tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. And we left. And this is exactly what we did. The following day, we uh, took uh, our car, five of us, and began to drive. And the road became worse and worse and worse. And the th it was just unbelievable trip. But I don't go into details of how we got there. But it took us uh, nine hours to reach the 250, 300 uh, kilometers that we had to go. We had to go up the mountain and then down. And when we arrived to vicinity, to the outskirts of this small town of 700 people, uh, our car, we stopped our car, and people were out, it was close to sunset, and people were playing, men and boys were playing some kind of a game, which is very similar to baseball. Okay, very similar. It had a bath and a ball and that kind of a phenomenon. And there were also different places that people were cooking outside their uh, evening meals and so forth. And as our car arrived, the whole group of people just got together like that. We later discovered that most of them had never seen a vehicle. So it was a very unusual thing to come to this kind of animal to come with the, instead of legs having, you know, wheels and all of those things. And they, so, and the tribal people always carry guns. And it's dangerous kind of a place. But nevertheless, we, 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 when you're young, thank God, you're stupid also. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and you're careless, so you, you do things that otherwise you wouldn't do, you see. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm glad we did it. <laughs> so we got out of the car, and uh, so people saw that we were ordinary human beings. And we we went and said, we have come to see Miresh Allah. And this very handsome, tall gentleman in his, his 30s walked and said, I am Miresh Allah. And we said, we are Baha'is from Isfahan. And the whole group said, Allah that's the way the Baha'is greet. God is the most glorious. And they came and we hugged each other and so forth. And it was just unbelievable. Suddenly this whole group of people. We later discovered that of the 700 people in 
که تا با 600 دفتمبر با هایست اوکی سو وی وی هاد مگنیفیسنت ریسپشن و وی هاد ماربلس تایم and uh, we started meeting and talking and seeing patients and so forth so several things happened during these four days that we were there we were planning to stay seven days but then the weather changed and we were told that if we didn't get over the mountain in time we would be there for six months. Mm-hmm. So we left earlier. But nevertheless, we had a number of days that were magnificent days. One of the things that we discovered was the manner of education of children and youth. In the Baha'i faith, the parents are responsible for education of their children, okay? Because education is a pathway to human progress and also to an enlightened spirituality, okay? And the idea is that if you cannot educate your children, then the spiritual assembly of your community has the responsibility to make sure that all children receive training. Now, in the Baha'i faith, you don't have a clergy. You don't have a priest. You don't have a mullah. You don't have anything of that nature. What you do, you elect every year nine persons among the adults in the community to be members of a spiritual assembly. And these people had been electing their spiritual assembly every year. And they, and they, when they started the spiritual assembly, none of them were literate. They were all illiterate. And they wanted to know what are the duties of a spiritual assembly and what they should do. So there was only one literate person in the whole tribe. And the tribe was a very large tribe, about more than 200,000 people or something like that. It was a very large tribe. And this here were this small Baha'i community of less than 1,000. And they, there was one literate person, and that was the mullah in the tribe, okay, the priest, Muslim priest in the tribe. And uh, they hired him to come and sit in the meetings of the assembly and read from the writings of the faith, Baha'i faith, about what are their responsibilities, okay, and also take notes of their discussions and decisions. And they paid him. So he, the mullah was happy to do it. <laughs> so he, he came and he read and said that, well, your, he said, your prophet says, meaning Baha'u'llah, that you should educate all boys and girls in reading and writing and sciences and all. So they said, okay, we hire you and we establish a little school and you are going to educate everybody. And sure enough, he started doing that and they start established the school. And then as the tribe grew further, there were other people who were literate and came back to the tribe. They engaged them. And by the time that we went there, everybody below age 30 was literate in the Baha'i community. People above age 30, some of them had tried to be literate. And where and some, they were older like me and their 
not. Now, that's a very interesting phenomenon. Here you are. This is an expression of spirituality in action. Here you are. You connect yourself with God through the revelation. Because that's the medium of spiritualization. And when you do that, then you begin to respond to the word of God. The will of God. And the will of God for this age is that everybody should be educated. Men and women. Okay? And therefore, what you do, you go about and educate your children. You see how remarkable that process is. A total transformation of the community. Something else happened there that was very interesting. On the second day that we were there, a delegation of two or three people, I think, I think there were three people, came from across the river where was the house of the leader of the tribe that we had met in the garage in Eswan. Okay, they came, they were his emissaries, and they said that the Khan, the leader, Khan's mother is sick, and Khan has asked that the doctor to go and treat his mother. Okay? Now, what you do? Because Khan, Khan has said, I kill you, <laughs> and he is he is powerful and he can do it these Baha'is are not going to be able to, to uh, defend you and so you have to decide what you do so we said to the emissary that we Baha'is when we go to a community we, you know, when we want to do something different, we consult with the spiritual assembly. And if the spiritual assembly approved, then we do it. The, the people didn't understand a word of what I said, okay? <laughs> because they had no notion of a spiritual assembly and consultation and discussion. As far as the, in an authoritarian tribal system, when the Khan says something to be done, it's done. That's it. You don't go and consult with ordinary people and discuss it with ordinary people and take permission. And if you are from the city and you come to the tribe, of course you are authority. You decide. You tell people what to do. They don't tell you what to do. So it was totally the opposite. So, so finally I said, go and tell the Khan this, this, this. So they went. It was a, not a very long distance, uh, about uh, an hour of uh, horseback ride from that village to this village through the river. And they came back and said, okay, you consult with your assembly. Juan said, you have to come. So we sat with the assembly and said, what should we do? And the conclusion was that we should go. Okay. So, as a physician and one other friend, got on the horseback for the first time in my life. <laughs> I never have been on the horseback. <laughs> it's all right. We have to go. We, we do it. Of course. <laughs> and the problem was that the horse had to go through a river, you know. And uh, it wasn't very deep river, but nevertheless would come up to, you know, to your uh, thighs. So, so I said to Mirish Khola, I never have been on horseback. What should I do? He said, let the horse take you. <laughs> I said, all right. And sure enough, the horse did it. And we went the other side. And we went 
and saw the mother of the Khan, and mother of Khan was sick. And the sickness that had was pneumonia. <coughs> and pneumonia in the village, in the tribe, was called the disease. <laughs> the disease. It was a disease that when people got it, they died. Mm-hmm. Okay? They died. Because it was an era that still was antibiotics just were coming and it, in that villages and those places they didn't have any access to them and so forth. So I, you know, and in, in Iran at that time the uh, custom was very interesting that when somebody would get sick the, that person would be on the bed in this room like this, let's say, and then about 30, 40 people would be sitting all around the bed, okay? So the patient and 30, 40 people sitting around. I arrived there, and Khan was sitting there, everybody very glum. And uh, I examined the mother and said to the Khan that uh, she's very sick. She sa- he said, yeah. She has disease. I said, okay, we have to treat him. And I said, please ask everybody to go out and so forth. And then at that time, when we uh, uh, penic- we used penicillin and we had to, uh, de- you know, to boil uh, the our syringe and uh, it was a mechanism dynamics of you go through preparing your your syringe and everything and it was a long and rather frightening process and you had these big needles and and uh, so I started doing all of these things and and prepared the penicillin and and the Khan said, she dies, you die. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's eye for an eye. So, so anyway, we, we, we gave the shot and gave the medication and other things. And, and uh, and the Khan then had organized a marvelous uh, dinner because hospitality is a, a, a must in that community. People are extremely hospitable. And then Khan said, you should go. And I said, no, we are staying because your mother needs penicillin every three hours. And we are not going anywhere. So no, you must go. I said, no, we are not going anywhere. So he organized, he gave us a room, and he had guards on the door all night because he was afraid that some of his people, tribesmen, would come and, you know, because they knew we were Baha'is and they would kill us and so forth. But he somehow changed. Somehow something happened to him that he decided that he had to protect us. And by the morning, the fever was gone. And the mother was in really good shape. And Juan became a friend. A friend, a long friend for many, many years, you see. It's amazing how this is the, the impact of a spiritual transformation that had taken place in that community of Kata. When Khan realized that a, a physician from outside would come to the tribe, consult with a number of people who were not literate, and would only decide to do something based on the decision, collective decision and then would, would go and treat his mother in the best way possible. 
these are these are dynamics of day to day application of spiritual principles to ordinary things that we do you see uh, the the mystical dimension of it is the impact that it has on people you see the mystical dimension is the impact of doing in a spiritually inspired activity when you do that it automatically touches the spiritual core of other human beings because we are by in our essence we are a spiritual being we we quest spirituality you see that defines our our reality and when when we experience actions that are of a spiritual nature that goes directly to our core of being this is why for example the nonviolent movement that is started by gandhi was effective because what gandhi did you know here were the british with all of their tanks and and uh, all the armaments of war and soldiers and everything and what gandhi did is that he said that no we are not going to be violent because violence is not in accord with the spiritual principles we are going to be acting according to the principles of love and nonviolence and by doing that it impacted the core of the being of the those people they they couldn't be as violent towards them as otherwise they have been are you okay So so you see how spiritual conditions evolve and develop under those circumstances I'll give you another example in the same tribe you see the transformation that takes place as you know as i mentioned uh, the tribe the bakhtiari tribesmen at that time were uh, uh, very bravado and very uh, masculine and very you know uh, very much uh, attached to their guns every young man or old man every bakhtiari man when they went around they had their guns the bahais when the mullah read to them He says that your leader says that you shouldn't carry gun, except for uh, if you're going hunting. Otherwise, you are not you are not supposed to become violent, and you should not kill, and you should not use guns. So Baha'is stopped using uh, having their guns with them when they went out. and that was unheard of nobody did that and when others began to see that the bahai men would go around without their guns they began to believe that the bahais had a very special powerful hidden capacity and began stories began to to be said that yes we know that somebody attacked you know uh, aimed his gun at a bahai who didn't have a gun and the bullet went and then it came back and hit the <laughs> uh, <laughs> the attacker and they began all kind of superstitious stories and so forth and everybody was sure 
that the reason that the Baha'is were not going around with, with their guns is was because they had hidden capacities. While Baha'is were going around because Baha'u'llah said, don't carry guns. <laughs> very simple, okay? But it's a very simple process. It's, it's, it, it transformed them. They began to act at a higher level. And when you begin to act at a higher level, it immediately impacts everybody else and everything else. This is the dynamics of transformation, spiritual transformation. That's the reason that, that in the context of everyday life, when a person begins to act according to the spiritual principles, they have enormous impact on other people. But in order to do that, we should have courage. The courage of being different. Because everybody wants to be the same. Nobody wants to stand out. Nobody wants to be different. But when you have the courage to be different, the courage to go according to your principles, then it has enormous impact on other people. Enormous impact. One other thing happened, which again has a reflection of this uh, impact of uh, of spiritual principles in everyday life. One night, around 2 o'clock in the morning, I was woken up by our host and actually I was awake because uh, the beds that we had were were not uh, uh, for one person there were also a lot of ticks and <laughs> a lot of other living beings <laughs> In them, so I hardly slept anyway. <laughs> so I was struggling to sleep and not to sleep and so forth. And they woke me up and said that there are two young people want to meet you. I said it's two o'clock in the morning. They said, "Yeah," but they they couldn't wait any longer. They want to see you. I said, "All right." So I go there and it's a young girl and a young man in there late teens, early 20s, late teens. Say so, yes, what can I do? And the young man says, well, I am a shepherd. Every day I uh, take my cattle and go on that hill and, uh, you know, have, take care of my cattle every day. And uh, she said that she had the responsibility to collect the uh, wood and uh, different uh, dried up uh, bushes and so forth from that hill. And because the boys and girls had to be separate from that hill and uh, for cooking and that kind of thing. And the boy was from a Baha'i family, and the girl was from a Muslim family. And they said that we have fallen in love. And when we go early morning to our respective uh, hills, we send messages to each other by singing. We, they, they sing love songs back and forth. And we have decided that we want to get married. And, but our parents, but the young boy said that my parents and they say that we agree if the parents of the girl also agree because in the Baha'i revelation, in the Baha'i faith, 
you have to have approval of the parents. Okay? And the mother and the father of the girl uh, have not agreed with the uh, with her to marry in a Baha'i family because uh, they needed the advice of an authority and they haven't found any ways of getting that advice. Until yesterday, when the mother had come and has been one of my patients, and the mother has said to the girl, if the doctor said it's okay, <laughs> <laughs> then I agree. <laughs> I said, oh, your mother said that. Yeah. <laughs> he said, yeah. My, and she started describing her mother, okay? I've seen about 200 patients, <laughs> women, you know. <laughs> as far as I was concerned, all were the same, you know. I said, you know, I, she said, yeah. My mother has said, if the doctor said okay, then it's okay. So, uh, what do you do under those circumstances? <laughs> you know, such purity, but such notion. You see, here they are again. They know about the Baha'i teachings that the parents have to agree with the marriage of their children. And therefore, they, they find ways of trying to to modify their way of doing and their traditions and so forth because usually the Muslim and the Baha'is didn't marry in that community. But here they decided that, okay, some something good, a gift has been brought by the Baha'i community to the whole community, the gift of uh, medicine and assistance and so forth. And it has had an impact. It, ha- it impacts the lives of people, impacts the decisions of people. Spiritual activities always have impact. All activities have an impact. But the impact of the spiritual, the spiritually uh, uh, enlightened activity has a profound impact. It has a transformative impact, you see. So, so these are some of the examples of the impact of, uh, of the nature of putting the spiritual principles in action in everyday life. You see. So, when you take it there, then, and expand it, you will see that at the core of the process of spiritualization is the process in which the unity within the individual and between the individual and other people and between the person and the whole life begins to take shape. Everything, spirituality, revolves around concept of unity. If you want to really live a spiritual life, you have to, to achieve the state of unity, inner unity, interpersonal unity, universal unity, unity with nature, unity with God, unity with the divine. The, the whole process is, is revolves around the capacity and the ability to create unity. And that's why the ultimate objective, social objective of the Baha'i faith meaning the spiritualization of civilization, is, expresses itself in the form of peace, a civilization of peace. The only Western 
a scholar that met Baha'u'llah, Edward Brown, he went to visit Baha'u'llah. And Edward Brown was an Orientalist and professor at Cambridge. And he went to Akka to visit Baha'u'llah. And he uh, wanted to see what is the message of this spiritual leader, okay, that thousands and thousands of people were willing to give their lives in order to uh, obey his teachings. And it is here, this is the way he describes his meeting with Baha'u'llah. Uh, he says, the face of him on whom I gazed, I can never forget, though I cannot describe it. Those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul. Power and authority sat on that ample brow, while the deep lines on the forehead and face implied an age which the jet black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxurious almost to the waist seemed to be like. No need to ask in whose presence I stood as I bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain. A mild, distinguished voice bade me be, to be seated and then continued. Now, Edward Brown has come in the presence of Baha'u'llah. And Baha'u'llah said, be seated, and then this is what Baha'u'llah said. This is the only occasion that Baha'u'llah, the manifestation of God for this age, had met with a Westerner. Okay? That's the only one. And here what he says. He says, Praise be to God that thou hast attained. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. Baha'u'llah at that time, and for most of his life, was a prisoner and an exile. We desire, we desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations. Yet the demons a stirrer up of a strife and sedition, worthy of bondage and banishment, that all nations should become one in faith, and all men as members, as brothers, I'm sorry, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened, that the diversity of religion should cease and differences of race be annulled. What harm is there in this? See, this is the process of spiritualization of the world. What meaning you create unity of humanity, oneness of humanity. You bring about peace. Yet so it shall be these f fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away and the most great peace shall come. This is the ultimate objective of the Baha'i dispensation and it is the fundamental objective, should be the fundamental objective of every Baha'i life. To be a cause of 
peace in our homes, in our relationships, between parents and children, between husbands and wives, between teachers and students, between workers and co-workers. The whole idea is to, to live such a life that would bring about harmony, cooperation, unity, and peace. That's the spirituality. That's, from a Baha'i perspective, that is a spiritual life. Okay? Yes, there is a wonder in these things. There is a mystery in these things. But the wonder and mystery would come without you seeking it. It would be a part of the process. You know, like I mentioned to you what happened in Qatar. Everything was wondrous, was full of wonder and full of mystery, but they happened by themselves. They happened concomitant with the process of trying to apply spiritual principles to everyday life. Okay? Rather than the other way around. The other way around is that people want to feel spiritual. So how am I going to feel spiritual? Okay. Well, probably I should take some mushroom <laughs> or some LSD <laughs> or some drugs or some hash. These are the ways that the people are trying to do it, okay? Or I go and sit by the sunset and to see what happens when the sun goes down. That's what happens, <laughs> okay? Yes, it is beautiful. This, yes, it is glorious. But these are momentary processes, glimpses of the divine. But if we want to be engaged in the process of discovering the divine, of connecting with the divine, of feeling the divine, then we have to put these principles of the revelation into action in everyday life. And as we do that, something dramatic happens. You see, something mysterious comes along with it. So, so these are some reflections on the uh, uh, process of exploring spirituality. Uh, you know, what I really have described here is applied spirituality, application of spiritual principles and how they impact our lives and lives of everybody around it that they come across that process.